Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I want to take a brief pause in our study through the Gospel of Luke to shed some light on what's happening in our world today and how we got here. So, Lord willing, for the next few weeks, we'll be in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, with a short little series I'm calling, How Did We Get Here? A Society in Decline. Look at part one this morning, the revealing of God to man, Romans 1, verses 18 through 20. Once you turn there, follow along as I read the text to set it before us till we dive in to see all of its depths and riches that it has for us. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Father in heaven, we ask for your help this morning. Help us to understand the word of truth before us, rightly dividing it, not through a cultural context, but through the biblical context, that you'd help us to understand where we are at. I pray that you impress this truth into our hearts, that we'd see the relevancy of Scripture, the truthfulness of it. Lord, and that you would help us not simply to be hearers of the word this morning, but doers of your word, that it would not simply produce in us Truth that leads to puffed up pride, but truth that would respond in humility and greater love for you in your greatness and greater love for you and the people around us. Humble us, Father, through the word we pray. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, I want to take a, a brief pause from the Gospel of Luke to shed some light on the state of the world that we find ourselves in. It does seem that more and more evil is being produced around us. Now, not, that's nothing new. But what is new is we're seeing new heights and elevations and celebrations of evil, even to the highest levels of the day and age that we have in our country. From a few months back, our vice president, being the first president or vice president to tour an abortion clinic, looking for ways that their administration can help with abortion bans of surrounding states, and what their administration can do to help further bring about more of this to that of last weekend, which was the proclamation on Easter Sunday of the Transgender Visibility Day, with our president stating this in his press release, today we send a message to all transgender Americans, you are loved, you are heard, you are understood, you belong, you are America and my entire administration, and I have your back. It's not new that wicked people will do wicked things. That's happened since the very beginning. Sinners sin. That's what we do. What is new is the elevation in society to the highest levels of what we're seeing now in our day and age. That not only is sin okay and accepted, it's elevated and celebrated as the highest good. To publicly proclaim these evils to celebrate them as good, to seek to advance more and more sinfulness and wickedness by whatever power they might have given to them is staggering. Think for a moment, why is it that abortion and transgenderism are raised as the banner flags of evil in our day? Because they represent the two gods that every individual unbeliever serves, sex and themselves. The ultimate expressions of self autonomy and self-rule. Keep in mind, slaughtering children is not new to Satan. He's done this ever since the beginning. Going way back to Exodus 1 with Pharaoh, when the Hebrews were multiplying, he told the Hebrew midwives, take the males and slay them and kill them. He was not alone in this. In Matthew 2, we find this is how Herod was trying to get rid of Jesus. He tells his soldiers to go throughout the city of Bethlehem and the surrounding districts, and any males two years and older, kill them. If God is the author of light and life, Satan is the author of darkness and death. 
But what about transgenderism? Understand, church, that Satan has been building towards the transgender movement for a while because through transgenderism, we have the unbeliever's new creation and their new resurrected body. If you step back and look at this, these things are not just unfolding randomly. Scripture clearly tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and principalities. This is Satan's work behind the scenes to orchestrate this and now crafting the unbelieving mankind in his own image. How do we see this? Well, consider some of the parallels between the biblical teachings that God gives us and that is what Satan has molded in his own image through transgenderism. In transgenderism, you have a new birth with a new name and a new identity. In transgenderism, you can become a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new is here. In transgenderism, you have a new circumcision of the body which comes through the scalpel of surgery. In transgenderism, you are resurrected to new life. There is a new birth. There is a new life. There is a new circumcision. There's a new creation through a new resurrection. Do you see the parallels? They're staggering. Why is this happening? Church, make no mistake. Evil cannot create. It can only replicate at best. Satan is the master counterfeit. Anything God does that is perfect in his image, Satan seeks to thwart and twist and mold in his image. Because we see this comparison laid out. Through transgenderism, man is self-created versus God-created. They're self-made instead of God-made. They're self-governed instead of God-governed. They're self-autonomous rather than submitting to God's authority. It's the ultimate affirmation and approval of the self. It doesn't seek to remove the condemnation for their sin. It seeks to remove the conviction of their sin to begin with. It's the ultimate banner of self-expression and self-glory because God glories in what He makes, correct? But if man recreates himself in his own image, who receives the glory? He does. So the question I want to pose for us over the next few weeks is, how did we arrive to a day and age where delusion is reality? How did we get to a place where a man can be a woman or a woman could be a man, where there are birthing people, where children are being mutilated and drugged from a few years old, where they're taken voluntarily to drag shows of pornographic material and flaunted before them, where you go to your local bookstore and are see on the children's sections scattered with rainbows, not from Noah's Ark, but from Satan's playhouse? How did we get here? Church, the Bible has the answer. You with me? You hear me? The Bible has the answer. Young, young people, children, students, can I get your eyes for a second? The Bible has the answers. Now here's what you have to do. You have to look for it. You have to read it. I mean, that's just basic, right? But as you'll see over the next few weeks, I'm going to describe not from myself, but through God's word written thousands of years ago, what's happening in your public schools? What is happening in the world that you see online? And it was written and recorded to us by God through the Spirit, writing this specific letter through the Apostle Paul. It'll be so helpful for us to pause and rewind the tape of society and say, how did we even get here to begin with? But please don't misunderstand my motives in this. You'll need to be here for each and every one of these sermons. Do not, I repeat, do not take one of these and throw it at your unsaved coworker for the arguments you've been having at the lunchroom as some sort of theological slam dunk that you got him. That is not what this is. We are in the church. My intents here are for you to equip you in the truth to understand what is happening in this world and to equip you to be resolved in the truth, to not be swayed, to not be wavered by the lies that exist outside these walls. But more than that, this is not designed to puff you up with pride because you have the truth. Because as we'll see, that's the grace that we've been given. For such were some of us, right? 
So this little series is not intended to puff you up. It's actually meant to promote humility within you. That the truth should move us not towards pride, but towards humility. As we see the greatness of our God, we see the brokenness of our world and the people, the souls who are being slaughtered and the souls who are being given over to Satan and the souls who are dying and going to face God's wrath for eternity because they reject the truth. This is intended to spur us on to greater love them, not in affirmation, because 1 Corinthians 13 says that love rejoices in the truth. We're to speak the truth in love to all of them and care for them as souls that need salvation. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself as I normally do because I'm excited. But we need to set this in verses 18 through 20 this morning. This really is the foundation that we'll build on the next few weeks. Again, please do not miss. Otherwise, you'll have a skewed and slanted, impartial view of this whole thing. But this morning, we'll look at verses 18 through 20 of Romans chapter 1 and understand why God's wrath comes against mankind. And in verses 18 through 20, we get two reasons. Why God's wrath comes against mankind, because that's, spoiler alert, the answer. Why are we in the society that we're in? Why is evil accelerating around us? One of many reasons is because God's wrath is being revealed now. Now, when we typically think of God's wrath, we think of eschatological final day judgment wrath. But we often miss what Scripture reveals like in our text this morning, that there is a version of God's wrath that's being revealed now in our world. And we'll see this morning two reasons why God's wrath is being revealed. First is because of sin. The second reason is because of the suppression of the truth. So first, let's look at verse 18. God's wrath against mankind for sin. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans is written to articulate the gospel. It is a gospel letter filled with riches of gospel fruit that comes from it. It's all about the gospel. Back up two verses to verses 16 and 17. This is God through Paul, his thesis of the whole letter. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans is all about the gospel. And in verses 16 and 17, Paul is setting up his main idea at the very beginning like a good writer and a good preacher. It's very clear what he's trying to do. How does that unfold throughout the rest of the letter? Well, Romans 1 gives his thesis statement and explains God's wrath against sin, which we'll get into this morning. Romans 2-3 through goes on to describe that all are guilty before God. Both Jews and Gentiles alike, everyone has failed God's standards. Everyone's guilty before God. Romans 4 then articulates by illustration that justification, we are declared righteous by faith, and it's illustrated through Abraham. We saw that last week. Chapter 5, Paul goes into how the gospel provides freedom from the wrath of God. Romans 6 He talks about the gospel providing freedom from sin. Chapter 7, the gospel provides freedom from the law. Romans 8, the gospel provides freedom from death through life in the Spirit. And Romans 9 through 11 talks about the scope of salvation, how wide it goes. And then Romans 12 through 15 is the response to the gospel, how the gospel transforms the way we live. It's all about the gospel. But the biblical order of the gospel is first the warning of danger, then comes the means of escape. You have to understand the bad news, otherwise there's no need for the good news. If the bad news is not that bad, no salvation is needed. We're fine in the state that we're in. And that's why God, through Paul, starting in verse 18, starts with the bad news. Look at verse 18. We see similar phrasing at the beginning of verse 18 as verse 17. Verse 17, for the righteousness of God is revealed. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed. We typically like to talk about God's righteousness rather than God's wrath, but they're both here paralleled because they're 
correlating attributes of God. Where God's righteousness is not upheld and where it's not practiced, God's wrath remains there. They're complementary. For God's wrath is God's hatred for sin and His hatred for anything that is contrary to His holy nature. We don't often like talking about the wrath of God, but you'd be surprised how often it's mentioned throughout Scripture because many times we make God into our own image. We're not supposed to do this. We're told explicitly in Scripture not to do this, but we think higher of ourselves than we should, and so we think that God is better than me, obviously, but He's a lot like me and his reasoning, and his rationalities, and his emotions. But we have to get this straight from the outset. God's wrath is not like our wrath. Our wrath is uncontrolled. It is unpredictable. It is spontaneous. It is unstable. It's unpredictable. You're happy one moment, then you're angry and wrathful the next. You don't believe me? What happens when the barista at Starbucks writes your name wrong on your cup? You might not say it, but dare I say, what happens if they get your beverage wrong? Oh, then you're saying it. We laugh at that, but how quickly do you turn on a pin on your spouse when they do something that does not meet your expectations? One moment you're happy, one moment there's wrath. Again, God is not like us. God's wrath is stable. God's wrath is measured. God's wrath is controlled. God's wrath is reasonable. It's justifiable as it parallels his righteousness in verse 17. But again, we would much rather talk about God's love. And just coming from Luke 15, God's love, that was awesome. Like, let's just stay talking about God's love. We like to talk about God's kindness, God's holiness, God's justice. But did you know that if you look up in a concordance how many references there are to the attributes of God in Scripture, the highest listed attribute of God is his wrath. Over 600 times throughout Scripture does it reference or mention God's wrath. Psalm 7 verse 11 gives us one of these. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That shows the severity of God's wrath against mankind. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, talked more about judgment and hell more than anything else. Why? Because the bad news presses in the urgency for the good news. If you don't understand the, de- the state of despair that you're in, you're not going to cry out for help and salvation from it. So while people don't like to talk about God's wrath, we have to understand God's wrath is God's hatred for sin. And verse 18 specifies where it comes from. It comes from heaven. Heaven is the source of God's wrath against mankind. And you'll notice also in verse 18, who is the recipient? Who's included in receiving God's wrath? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Not just some, not just the ones he doesn't particularly like. Again, God is not like us. We read it in James 2 just moments ago, did we not? The sin of partiality. God is impartial, perfectly just. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. And notice the tense of the verb in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed. Present, ongoing, tense, right now, it's happening. Again, this is not the final wrath of God for all of eternity, but it is a measure of God's wrath present in this time. Because as you read throughout the scriptures, you come to understand that God's wrath has two primary forms in which it's manifested. There is this form of God's intervening, cataclysmic, situational judgment that he brings on. Think of the global flood. That's God intervening and judging, exhibiting his wrath. Think of him wiping out the older, complaining generation of the Israelites. Think of sending them into exile. This is God's wrath. But there's another manifestation of God's wrath that comes through the natural course of consequence from man's sin. Reaping what you sow. The consequences that sin causes in your life and the lives of those around you. This is a built-in moral law with its corresponding consequences. This is the wrath of God revealed in verse 18. We'll see it in even more clarity as the text goes on in future weeks. 
This is the consequences of man's sin playing out in full detail from around us and among us. Society is reaping what it has sown. And so this first reason why God's wrath is revealed in an ongoing sense is because of ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's because of present sin against God. There's two words in verse 18, and they're similar but different. There's a word of ungodliness that's there. It talks about the attitude, a lack of respect, showing bold irreverence towards God. It's shaming Him, despising Him in attitude. The next word is unrighteousness. If ungodliness is talking about wrong attitudes of submission, unrighteousness is that of wrong actions, wrong character, conduct of defiance. It literally means injustice, going against the justice of God in how we live. So sin is the greatest injustice against God because of His perfect and His holy character. Therefore, it will be served with the corresponding justice of God through His ongoing wrath of consequences for sin. His wrath is revealed against dishonor and against defiant conduct and character. But it doesn't take long to think, how does this actually play out in life? How do we see somebody's natural consequences of their sin building up and not just hurting themselves, but hurting their household and hurting those around them? Well, think of the sin of alcoholism, being given over to wine or strong drink. An addict to this, given long enough, it brings and promotes liver disease from within. Lots of bodily harm can come from excessive drinking. Similar to smoking. Somebody who's addicted to smoking and smokes for a long period of time, and over the course of their life, it can bring about lung and mouth cancer. Think of it for sex outside of marriage. It brings sexually transmitted diseases. We've seen homosexuality can bring HIV AIDS. We've seen transgender surgery can bring irreversible destruction upon the body. Consequences for the rest of their life. Consider hormone therapy. Changing somebody's chemical makeup has consequences we don't even know yet. But the studies keep coming out, and they're worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It's reaping what you sow. But the lie of Satan is that your sin only affects you. Many times that's the justification why you might give in to it. This isn't going to hurt anyone else. It's just, it's just me. If we go back down through that list, we can see how just one sinful decision can wreak havoc in a family's life. Take alcoholism, for example. The consequence is not just against the body, but the financial hardship that comes through it. When somebody's given over to strong drink and all sense of reason and rationality are gone, they can do whatever sinfulness they want to and they're not even aware of it, even abusing their own family members. And you hear stories and accounts of children who are abused in any sort of way because of the strong drink of the parents, and they now live and grow up with that damage for the rest of their life. Consider that of sex outside of marriage. I mentioned the STDs before, but consider the relational turmoil that comes from practicing this outside of God's good designed gift of one man, one woman to the confines of marriage. That when a man and woman becomes one flesh, not just do they come at physically, but there's chemicals that are released that attract them to each other for more of this. And so you separate this from the permanent covenant of marriage, and all of a sudden you're now affecting future relationships that come from this. Not only that, but you can even consider unexpected, unplanned pregnancies that come. And that's where the abortion mill is running rampant. You see abandonment by the Father in situations like this. Why? All because of sinful actions affecting not just you, but future generations. You can imagine the devastation in one life, but imagine a world that's given over to these practices on a day-in and day-out basis. You can see how it compounds and it builds and it grows and it corrupts and it contaminates and it takes over and there's so much hurt, harm, and brokenness from it. This is reaping what you have sown. Natural consequences of sin's choices. Again, these things don't always happen, but there is a pattern that we see consistently through them. This is the first reason why God's wrath is revealed against mankind because of their sin. Ongoing ungodliness, ongoing unrighteousness, 
They want to live in their sin and they will receive the fruits of their sin, Proverbs 1 says, and they'll eat the fruits of them. But there's a second reason given in the text. It comes at the end of verse 18 and into verse 20. God's wrath against mankind for suppression. Suppression. Look at the tail end of verse 18. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People dishonor God with their sinful attitudes. They defy God's order through character and sinful conduct. And what comes, what's the root of this? Why are they doing this? One of many reasons comes at the end of verse 18. They do this because they're suppressing the truth. They're running trying to convince themselves otherwise of the one true God who exists. This idea of suppressing the truth, it means hindering or stifling the truth. It's an image of holding something down, suppressing it. Think of a kid who's playing in the movies with a a, a jack-in-the-box. It springs up. Try to put the -the jack-in-the-box back in, and you're going against the spring. It's resisting, trying to suppress it. Another picture I like to use when we talk about suppression, it's that of a a kid in a pool with a beach ball, right? What does every kid do when there's a beach ball in there? It's like some unspoken rule. They've got to try to get it underwater. And so they put all of their little might in there. They put their full body on it, and they're trying to balance themselves, and they might successfully do it for 10, 15 seconds, maybe a minute, but then what? It shoots back up. Similar picture that we see here of somebody who suppresses the truth, tries to hold the truth down. Because people, why do they suppress the truth? Because they can't change the truth. Understand, church, that as soon as you change the truth, it becomes error. It no longer is truth. Truth is pure in its clarity, in its character. You cannot change the truth. You cannot alter or tamper the truth. It can be suppressed, though. Not successfully, but momentarily. How do people suppress the truth? What are some ways in which they do this? They suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. They hold down God's existence and His Word. How do they do that? Well, lots of different ways, but the prominent one is the distraction by lies. If we put a lot of false truths, half-truths, error, sprinkle it in, then people won't know what's real and what's not, or so they think. Among the most prominent of these lies is the idea that truth is relative. It's very prominent in our world today to hear that. Truth is relative. It changes from person to person. That you can have your truth that you live by, I have my truth that I live by, and we can coexist based on both of ours being true. Unless yours comes against mine, then yours is not okay because mine's the absolute truth. And you see the cycle of illogical fallacies that circle throughout it all. Because they would dogmatically say that there's no such thing as absolute truth, which is in itself an absolute statement. There's no logic. We'll see this as Romans 1 goes on. There's no logic. Why? Because God is logical. Because God is the author of logic. He's the author of truth. And everything that he operates by is truth and is logical. So you cannot reason based on logic. And Romans 1 also tells us why. Spoiler, we'll get there in the future. So hang on. It's one of the lies that they tell you is truth is relative. There's another lie. People are basically good. I'm not as bad as I could be. Also not as good as I could be. But I have based within me this inherent goodness. What's another lie they believe? Life is random. It's left to chance, meaning anything can happen. And there's lots of theories that divulge from this. One of this is the lie of evolution. Millions upon millions upon millions of years, everything evolved to be what it is today. It all happened by chance. This is also the lie of the Big Bang Theory. In the beginning was nothing which exploded. Thus resulted in where we're at today. Similar lie in Christian circles of theistic evolution, which is simply evolution prepackaged to accommodate a little bit of the Bible so that we remain secularly okay with those in the world. We have some scholarly appeal from the secularists in the world. 
that they go along with evolution, but we just say God starts it and then launches it off and evolution takes it from there. There's lots of flaws with this. One of them is simply that evolution demands millions of years of the cycle of death. And where does death first come into play? Genesis 3, after man was already created. Again, you can see right through it if you know the truth. Another lie that they believe is you are in control. You're in control of your life. You can be what you want to be. I might have been told when that when you were younger. Is that true? I mean, are you the professional ball player, men, that you wanted to be when you were six, seven, eight years old? Is this the off season or what happened? You know, that doctor that you wanted to be when you were 10 and you realized how much schooling goes into that. I don't know if I can cut for that. What do all of these lies point to? There's no God. The lie that truth is relative? Well, if truth is relative, you have no need for the Bible. If people are basically good, you have no need for salvation. If life is random and left to chance and you are in control, there's no need for God. You are the functional God of your life. You can do what you want to do, participate in whatever sin you want to participate in, And it's not only okay, it's accepted and celebrated that you're embracing the true essence of who you are. But all of these are fallacious. They're all lies. Trying to cover and trying to convince themselves and others that if there's no God, if we can explain away the origins, then we can explain God away. If we can explain God away, we can explain the Bible away. If we can explain the Bible away, then I'm not a sinner and I don't need salvation and I can live however I want to. These are different ways they suppress the truth. But even, get this, even in their suppression of the truth, they are affirming what the Bible says is true. Think about it. If we didn't have absolute truth, there would be nothing that needs to be suppressed. But in their reasoning, in their actions in their pursuits of trying to silence the truth they're proving the bible is real and true because it was written thousands of years ago how do we know that we have the truth well verse 19 goes on to say that the truth has been made known by god verse 19 Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. It repeats it in two different ways for emphasis. He's made it known to every individual internally. How? Because he's shown it to them externally. You can know it in the subjective reasoning of the heart because God has demonstrated this through creation in the objective reasoning of his created world. And so how do we know that there's truth? Verse 20, because it's revealed by his creation. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and his Godhead. Theologians refer to these as general revelation and special revelation. Special revelation, that being of the gospel and the the Bible, that which leads to salvation. There's this general revelation that God gives through the conscience. Romans 2 talks about that, this internal moral compass that you go anywhere in the world and you find this sense of what is right and wrong. But then even before that, here in the text, it shows us that God's divine witness that he gives is his created world. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Through the visible world, we can come to know this invisible God. Specifically, His eternal power and His Godhead, meaning that He's the one true God. How do we see all this? Just look at creation. Consider the order that exists in creation. There are certain laws by which the world operates. Laws such as the laws of physics or polarity, laws of cause and effect. There's not randomness that exists but there are consistencies that happen. Consider the water cycle. How is it that it happens over and over? It's a cycle. It's not random. It's ordered. Think even to the smallest microcosm of the human cell, among which millions and billions have to exist within you, but even in the microcosm of the cell, every cell is working in a consistent and similar manner. Otherwise, you and I cease to live. 
from the greatest down to the smallest, God demonstrates certain consistencies in this world which can be observed. Why? Because we serve a God of order and He wants us to know it. Consider God's design in creation. Consider the smallest little insect that brings much joy to our lives and our homes and kitchens, that of ants. Ants can be the smallest little creature. That's what Proverbs elevates as the ant is the animal insect picture of diligence. And so ants can't accomplish any of their work on their own. They work in a community to produce it. Therefore, it's fascinating. That's why ants don't sleep for more than a minute at a time, kind of like new moms. It's, it's 200 and 50 one-minute naps throughout the day. Why? So that the full colony is always at disposal to do what the colony does. It's designed. I read this week that there are some birds that are able to navigate their migration patterns by the stars. And there's been studies done of even those who've been hatched and raised indoors. As soon as they are shown an artificial sky, think of a planetarium or something of the like, they're able to orient themselves based on on the stars and migrate accordingly. Amazing. Why does a duck have webbed feet but a cow doesn't? It's designed. Why does mankind have opposable thumbs but fish don't? It's designed. You can go through each and every part of creation and find design. Why? Because we serve a God of extraordinary design and He wants us to know Him by it. Everything has a reason and a divine design of a purpose. That's why you don't have a nose on your foot. That would be so weird, but it would also not have a function or a purpose. Consider the beauty in creation. I mean, have you been out to Naples and sat on the beach at sunset? I mean, not even the most gifted painter could come up with the color combinations stretched across the fabric of the sky that we see. Colors I'm pretty sure we haven't even realized exist yet. Look at the pristine blue waters of the Caribbean Sea turning into the ocean, the different hues and the brilliance of the blues that are there. Look at the natural aura of the northern lights. Look at the leaves that fall in autumn. How even a leaf is given a short cycle to live, yet it demonstrates the brilliant beauty even in its death by its created God. When you're flying in an airplane, you look out and see the clouds that are stretched like a blanket across the sky. Why? Because we serve a God of beauty, and He makes His beauty known in His creation. Consider the intricacy in creation. We talk about bigger scales. Let's go down to one of the smallest scales that we have to operate by. Think of this. If every molecule in one drop of water were the size of a grain of sand, you could build a road half a mile wide, a foot deep from Los Angeles to New York. All the molecules in one single drop of water. Why? Because we serve God of the intricate details, and He displays this intricacy in His creation. Consider the variety in creation. I mean, if I created everything, I'll be very honest with you. There would be like one bird, <laughs> one tree, one flower. Why? Because it's, I'm a functional guy. Like, it's doing its purpose. It's functional. It's good. Why do you need more? Again, good thing God is not like me. There are over 10,000 species of birds, most of them having their own unique song that they sing. There are over 400,000 different types of flowering plants that survive in different climates and contexts with different seasons. I mean, look at the very detail in a snowflake. A snowflake, if you've lived in South Florida, if you've seen it in the movies, is snow that falls from the sky. (laughs) And it's not just big white puffs that fall. You look at one of those... That's easy because I'm from the Midwest, right? If you look at one of those snowflakes under a microscope and you compare it with all the other snowflakes, each one of them has a unique signature to it. Each one is different. And you zoom out and see all of the snow that has ever existed and will ever exist, all of these things taking place. Consider the similar thing with fingerprints. 
No two fingerprints are alike. Why? Because we serve a God of capacity, and He demonstrates His capacity through the variety in His creation. He wants us to know Him, and so He demonstrates that in His creation. There's one more. Consider God's power in creation. We talked about the clouds moments ago. Clouds weigh from one million to over one billion pounds. How that's measured, I don't know. I trust the scientists with that one, I guess. But they just hang from the sky like they weigh nothing at all. Consider the moon and how it spins around the earth and how the earth spins on its own axis, moving 1,000 miles per minute around the sun. And the sun moves about a half million miles per hour around the center of the galaxy. And we worship the Creator God who holds it all in the palm of His hand. Why? To show us that He is a powerful God. What is this magnificent display of order, of design, of beauty, of intricacy, of variety, and power reveal? That God exists. And no one can deny it. Robert Jastrow, an astrophysicist and director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has said this, Now we see how the astronomical evidence supports the biblical view of the origin of the world. The essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. Consider the enormousness of the problem. Science has proven that the universe exploded into being at a certain moment. It asks what cause produced this effect. Who or what put the matter and energy into the universe? And science cannot answer these questions. For the scientist who has lived by his faith and the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who've been there for centuries. While astronomers can't see the visible God or the invisible God, with even the most advanced telescope, with the naked eye, they can see His creation. They can see His visible work of His own hands. In reading this week, I came across a story about Helen Keller, who from the earliest uh, of points of her life was deaf and blind. Someone who we think general revelation couldn't reach her. And through the tireless efforts of Anne Sullivan in her life, Helen was eventually able to read and speak. And when Anne first told Helen about God... She said she already knew of him. She just didn't know his name. How does she know? How does she know who God is? Because even though being blind from the earliest of ages and deaf, she's still been affected by God's created world. She has the inner conscience of Romans 2. She knows the struggle against right and wrong. Bottom line, even she knew. Charles Hodges, the theologian of the past, writes this, God therefore has never left himself without a witness. His existence and perfections have ever been so manifested that as rational creatures are bound to acknowledge and worship him as the true and only God. Who is it that God has chosen to bring to the witness stand to attest to his divine existence? It's been around since the beginning of creation. It's the world. You cannot look at the height and the depth and the breadth and the intricacy and the detail of God's creation and deny His existence without suppressing the truth. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for every created person who's ever lived outside of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Look at the end of verse 20. So that they are without excuse. What's the result of such revelation from God as He's given us in His creation? There are no excuses for not knowing Him. Without excuse, that word there is the Greek word anapologetis. What's that sound like to you? Apologetic. That's what we get our word for apologetic from. Apologetic means to make a defense or to argue a case against something. And here is God through Paul 
listing at the end of verse 20 that there is no apologetic that has ever existed or will ever exist to deny the existence of God by his creation. Any argument against the existence of God is indefensible according to God through Paul. Now, no doubt there are many apologetical approaches that many in the Christian faith use to try and sway people to reason and believe in God and repent of their sins and trust in Him. Many of them having great intentions and great desires and the same goal of conversion. My apologetical approach as your pastor is very simple. It's Romans 1, 18 through 20. Everyone knows God exists. I don't have to prove it. No more than God does not have to prove His existence in Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God How do we know? Look around, he says. No one else could even do a fraction of this. So we don't need to prove God exists. Everyone knows he does, and that's why they have elaborate theories of evolution, of belief systems, of religions, etc., to convince themselves otherwise. Why? Because if God exists, then I'm under the authority of somebody else besides myself. If God exists, I have to take his word seriously. I have to live by what he says. And according to what he says, I've sinned. I cannot live according to what he says. I am a sinner sentenced to his wrath forever. That means they would have to come to Christ and bow the knee in repentance and faith before the king himself. And we'll see it as we go throughout. They don't want to come to the light. Why did Jesus say it through John? John records it. Why do they hate the light? Because their deeds are evil. And so they stay away from the light, suppressing the truth and living in darkness. So this truly teaches us there is no such thing as an atheist. There's no such person as an agnostic. There are only those, by category of Scripture, are suppressors of truth. So how did we get here? Again, let's dial back to that very first question I asked at the outset. How did we get to be where we are at in our society? First and foremost, we have to recognize that truth has been given and truth is currently being suppressed and ungodliness and unrighteousness flow from it. And people receive the consequences of their sinful choices. Proverbs 1, towards the end, they're eating the fruits of their sinful ways. Because where truth is suppressed, sin abounds. And over the next few weeks, Lord willing, we'll continue to see the results vividly displayed of God's wrath, which flow through truth suppressors and the ensuing wickedness that comes to a society when it's filled with truth suppressors and living out ungodliness and unrighteousness. So what do we learn, church, at the outset of this text? The truth matters. The truth matters. Do not mess with the truth. Do not twist the truth. Do not distract away from the truth. Do not twist it. Do not malign it. Do not slander it. Do not suppress it. Do not silence it, lest it be consequence for you because of your unrighteousness. Proverbs 23, 23 says this, Buy the truth and do not sell it. What's the greatest thing? you and your family could ever have in this world? The truth. And as we heard from Brother Jeff a few weeks ago, a lot of ways you can digest the truth through God's Word, through reading books, through singing, through music, through conversation, all of these things, but the primary avenue through which we get the truth preached and articulated through this is through the preaching of the Word. So church, you have a very easy opportunity to practice this before you over the next few weeks. Because unless you think about sleeping or hiding under a rock for the next seven days, you'll continue to see the evil that exists in our world. So take advantage of this, parents. Don't in pride say, look at them, how could they do that? No, 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 you're getting the whole character wrong. Do you see what the Bible says is true? That's why your friend at school is doing the things they're doing. That's why on the news they're talking about these things this way. They're proving the Bible's true. 
greatest affirmations of the truth is happening before our very eyes. And we have an opportunity not just to guard the truth, not just to protect the truth, not simply to be nourished by the truth ourselves, but to pass the truth on to future generations. The truth matters, church, because the world suppresses it. Therefore, we must do everything in our lives to elevate it for our lives, for our family's lives, and to be a lighthouse in this very dark world. Pray for us and we'll conclude. Father in heaven, we ask for your help for us to understand the word of truth this morning. No doubt there are many things that are difficult to stomach and things to hear. But God, we thank you that you've given us a clear word of truth that we can rightly understand it. That through this we can come to understand why the world is the way that they are and why we would be the way that they are, but not for your gospel of grace. So God, I pray and ask that this would be applied not in pride, not in boasting and arrogance, lest we prove that we've learned nothing. But God, that this would be applied in humility as we see your greatness, your majesty, your magnificence in your created world, may we humble ourselves before you and cling to the truth. Pray that you'd help every person here. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.